Good morning, good afternoon to my African colleagues. I'm here from uh, Uganda, from the Uganda National Oil Company. Um, I'm here to talk to you about our own uh, oil and gas journey, starting from uh, over the last few years. I think I thought the first thing that would be important would be to talk a little bit about our uh, sector governance, um, just because it puts it into pro the proper context um, for the balance of the presentation. Um, our fiscal regime, our petroleum fund, is uh, managed by the Ministry of Finance. We have a, a regulator, the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, that handles the uh, all matters regulation, um, and that is relating to the upstream and midstream in, 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 uh, in our context. And the downstream is regulated uh, still by the Ministry of Energy, that is generally responsible for oil and gas policy, investor promotion, and all manner of licenses. Licenses in the upstream for the blocks, the oil and gas uh, exploration blocks, as well as uh, licensing, for example, for the refinery. You now we have the Uganda National Oil Co Company, and we represent the commercial business interests of the state. And, uh, and I'm here um, as a representative of, of uh, UNOC. Uh, yesterday I was listening to some of the uh, discussions from our Namibian colleagues about the need to go beyond a, an oil and gas policy, or at least policy, I think it was relating to national content. Um, I, I thought I'd give at least some idea of our regulatory framework um, is the National Oil and Gas Policy, which is basically the key guiding document for our sector. And out of that sprung up a number of laws. The Petroleum Act, which is relating to basically upstream, was from, promulgated in 2013. And then we have also the, uh, the Midstream Act that was uh, promulgated the same year. And we have, of course, the Public Finance Management Act and lots of other uh, regular, uh, relevant statutes. All our regulations relating to the upstream and midstream were, as well as national content and, and other areas, were developed in uh, 2016. UNOC is a private limited company, but we are 100% uh, state owned. We're established by an act, the Petroleum, uh, sorry, the Upstream Act that I talked about earlier in 2013. We have about nine mandates, and we've only highlighted three in this presentation, which is essentially handling the state's commercial interests in the petroleum sub subsector. We have a, a very key mandate on developing in depth expertise in the sector, not just within our company, but um, also outside, uh, basically to Ugandans in general. And we are also uh, very innovative with respect to uh, new ventures. So we're, we're expected by statute to develop downstream ventures both uh, locally and later internationally. Our board of directors is appointed by His Excellency the President of the Republic of Uganda and uh, the board members are approved by Parliament. Uh, the board membership is constituted by uh, members of, of, of different professions, and uh, that is actually also in the law. We have two shareholders, the Minister of Energy and Mineral Development, which controls 51% of our shareholding, and then the Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, that, that controls the other 49%. We have two subsidiaries. Um, one is the Uganda Refinery Holding Company, for whom I'm the accounting officer, responsible for refining and petrochemical related businesses and then we have the national pipeline company that's responsible for pipelines uh, terminals and, and also uh, what we call bulk, bulk product uh, trading the scope of our activities cover the entire petroleum value chain uh, from upstream through to downstream and, and the way we are delivering services 
uh, across that value chain is through uh, joint ventures. So in the next slide, you will see this is UNOC at a glance. It essentially covers all the areas that we're currently active in. Um, today, I'm going to talk specifically about the East African crude oil pipeline, of which we have a 15% um, uh, ownership or share ownership of. And, um, and also the Kavalega Petro Basin Industrial Park, which is a three, roughly 3,000 hectare, in, uh, actually it's more like a special economic zone, and at least it's involved evolving out to that. And uh, that, uh, that hosts that will host our refinery, but also hosts ECOP, the East African Crude Oil Pipeline Pump Station Number One, and it also hosts Uganda's second. Um, International Airport that has a primary purpose of cargo, at least initially, to support the oil and gas uh, development. Um, we have two major um, upstream ventures at this time. There's the Tilenga uh, production area that is uh, operated by Total Energies, and then we have the Kingfisher production area that is operated by Sinoc, that's the Chinese national. Uh, this is oil corporation. In both those ventures, you know, has a 15% participation. So essentially, we're going to go from the upstream Kingfisher Tilenga, which has a, a recoverable reserves estimated at 1 billion barrels. Our stoic is, is, is uh, quite a bit higher, but this is really focusing on the recoverable reserves. And uh, our balance sheet is shown, though we are still under capitalization. So our capitalization journey started in 2016, and uh, as of today, we're at around roughly 300 million US dollars. Most of that, those are cash funds that government has channeled into the East Africa crude oil pipeline, which is currently in uh, construction. Um, when we talk about this park. It's um, uh, essentially, as I said earlier, 3,000 hectares of, of land, which is on a power with many of the, um, let's say, several of the large industrial parks that we have in, in, uh, in, in, on, on the globe. Um, it's roughly the same size as the Jerome Island in Singapore, although Jerome Island has three refineries and five petrochemical complexes. And what's unique about our park is we also have a, an airport that runs right through the middle of it. Uh, in the northwest of the park, we have the heavy industry zone, which is essentially refinery, petrochemicals, and uh, fertilizer area, as well as pump station one for the East African crude oil pipeline. And then in the northeast of the airport, we have the light medium industry zone, and there's commercial, and, uh, and also there will be areas for, for residential areas. So there's a lot going on in the air. As I mentioned earlier, we have the second international airport, which currently is focused on cargo. There will be some passenger handling capacity, but it's relatively small. Some in the region of about 50 passengers per hour. Uh, it's under construction with 91% complete. So the runway is complete. We really are working towards operationalizing that airport. Um, we have the crude oil export hub that is also under construction that is being managed by the ECOP company. And uh, then we have the refinery for which the feed is complete. We're still working on value engineering and the likes. Um, our environmental social impact assessment is complete. And we are funding it under what's known as a public sector led funding plan. Originally, it was supposed to be private sector led. Um, but probably in the panel discussion, we'll be touching on the fact that uh, it was very difficult to raise private capital in the current uh, energy transition environment. It's very difficult to raise, raise private capital for uh, oil and gas projects in, on the African continent in general. And uh, fertilizing the petrochemicals and industrial gases are all activities under feasibility. And we also plan cold chain because we, all, we have a, an agro processing component of the park that will link essentially to the airport for export of uh, Ugandan uh, produce. 
uh, you have good infrastructure in place, um, high voltage power, which is shown in this picture, uh, road road network as well as the as well as the airport that, as I said, is currently still under construction. Um, it's expected from a macroeconomic perspective. We've done some economic studies uh, that this park will contribute to the region of about five billion dollars a year to our national GDP. Uganda's current GDP is roughly forty-five billion dollars per annum. So this park on its own represents approximately ten percent of our GDP in term once we get it up and running in, in, in full swing. Projection for that is, is somewhere around 2035. We expect the park to be uh, at least 90% occupied. Um, there will be a significant contribution to national capital formation, balance of payments, and fiscal impact. And importantly, we're seeing 35,000 uh, job opportunities. Um, as I should probably put in the context that we have um, this area of the country was very relatively underdeveloped. Uh, we had no real road infrastructure in place. So government has uh, committed over the last, uh, probably something like eight years, um, 800 kilometers of roads have been developed, uh, costing approximately $1 billion. So that infrastructure had to go in place just to support construction of uh, the upstream as well as uh, midstream projects. Uh, we're going to develop this park together with a, a, a SEZ, uh, sorry, Special Economic Zone operator that has a lot of experience. There will actually be a South African company that we'll be working with. And uh, we're working a lot on enabling infrastructure. I apologize for the acronyms. Some of the acronyms are basically all the agencies we work with the National Roads Authority, Ministry of Works and Transport, the Electricity Transmission Company, the Ministry of Water Environment. And there's also the National Information Technology Authority for the IT activity. And we're currently in design, but also some early construction work. Um, we've done a regional ESIA, a strategic ESIA, uh, which essentially means then we can insert projects under that regional ESIA. They just need to do what's known as project briefs. And of course, we're working to promote linkages with agriculture. Remember, Uganda. 70% of Ugandans are employed by agriculture and it contributes roughly 25% directly to GDP. The ECOP, the East African Rural Pipeline, is another project that's currently in construction. It's running from Western Uganda in Hoima uh, all the way to Tanga in Tanzania, 1,449 kilometers total, running through eight regions, 24 districts. Um, that pipeline routing uh, had to pass and bypass some very uh, environmentally sensitive areas. And as Uganda, we've received, and Tanzania, we've received a lot of uh, harsh criticism from activist groups uh, around, uh, around the world, particularly the developed world, who have not wanted us to develop that pipeline. But that project is moving forward. Um, we are in a shareholding arrangement in that project. Total Energies owns 62% of the shares. The UNOC and the uh, Tanzania Petroleum, De Petroleum Development Corporation owns 15%. We own 15% each. And then CNOC owns 8% of that project. It's a $5 billion project. We're talking roughly about 40% share capital, 40% equity, and 60% debt. Raising that debt in the international capital markets has been very difficult, very challenging, but we have been successful, uh, although the majority of the, the funding has actually come from, uh, from, from the Chinese government for that project. Uh, there's also a lot of a heavy funding component from the Middle East, from Africa, uh, including South Africa. And uh, that kind of is informing our strategy with respect to how to, re how to fund the refinery uh, because we essentially opted to go to a public sector-led uh, funding strategy for the, for the refinery. Our projection is first oil in 2025. Um, 
I'm talking about pipeline integrity. Uh, here we first the, 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 the pipeline will be buried across its entire <coughs> uh, So once it's constructed and buried, the top soil and surface the vegetation will be reinstated and people and animals will be able to pass freely across. There have been a lot of misinformation about this pipeline in terms of blocking you know, animal movements and so on. It only happens during construction. Once it's buried, uh, we're essentially going back to the way nature was in those areas. It will be monitored 24-7. There will be operational patrols, remote monitoring, and we'll also work with local communities to monitor the integrity of that pipeline. Uh, we have the fiber optic cable that will measure temperature changes, uh, intrusion across the, uh, along the entire length of the pipeline. The fiber optic cable also gives Uganda a second major link to SECOM, so we'll be able to basically double our, our bandwidth capability as a nation and that helps our development. And so that will come along with this pipeline loop too. we we'll developed contingency plans in case of oil spill recovery and, and there's a comprehensive suite of environmental and social management programs uh, to make sure the project stays sustainable. In terms of land acquisition, we had a lot of uh, project affected persons, approximately 13,500. 94% uh, have, have signed compensation agreements and compensations are paid to 88%. So we're still in the process uh, of, of compensating uh, individuals that were affected by the pipeline. So this data is, is good as of uh, last month. Uh, some, uh, some people opted for housing as opposed to, so this is improved housing as opposed to simply re receiving cash. Uh, and so these are some statistics relating to uh, 547 houses split between Uganda and Tanzania uh, that uh, where people have opted for housing. We've also had to replace churches, replace boreholes, replace schools. There's a lot of other infrastructure, national infrastructure is affected in both countries. Number of lessons learned, uh, land acquisition challenges uh, are quite high in Uganda because we have a number of different types of land tenure systems. We have customary, we have private, we have public land. By contrast, in Tanzania, all land is public remains vested in the president as a trustee for and on behalf of all citizens. I'm not quite sure what the setup is in, in Namibia, but I'm sure I'll learn that by the end of this presentation. Uh, avoidance of sensitive ecosystems has been a key to how we develop the project, in terms of environmental social studies, um, and there's a lot of information that's publicly available on these projects because project has really been uh, accused of many things uh, which are absolutely not true. Um, always free prior informed consent have, has, has been obtained from individuals that are affected. I remember that it's Ugandans implementing these projects and we care about our fellow citizens, we care about our fellow East Africans and care about Africa in general. So there's no reason to assume that that, that human rights are being violated on a large scale by such a project. Um, we've also independent, employed independent bodies of experts for diversity, for land advisory, just to provide unbiased, unbiased third party environmental and social performance reviews. And then finally, we've been looking at minimizing carbon emissions. So this, this project is one of the lowest projects in terms of the upstream and the midstream, so the pipeline itself, in terms of carbon emissions per barrel of oil produced, we're talking about 13 kilos of CO2 equivalent. Uh, and we're looking at the integration of renewable energy, so Uganda's power system is 100% renewable, hydro-based, uh, from essentially the River Nile. And we are uh, using hydropower to power the upstream, to power the pump stations, uh, not just in Uganda, but also in, in, in Tanzania. We also have an ESG strategy, as, as, as you know, looking at environmental considerations, we need to adapt to the energy transition, social considerations, we need a social license to operate, uh, that's key. So we need to have sustainable relationship with project host communities, we don't want to end up in situations where we're 
essentially at war with our with our communities, um, and, and there's of course the big promotion of national participation in there. And I'll touch on that shortly. But you can't really do the E and the S, the environment and the social, without strong governance. So there's a real big focus on governance as well, not just on the national level in terms of how the oil and gas sector is organized, but also each of the individual institutions, uh, there's a big uh, focus on that. So as you know, we focus particularly on high ethical standards uh, in terms of code of conduct. And, and of course, we're also focusing on the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which is something we want to emphasize that you know, climate action and most of these activists have been focused very much on on SDG number 13, which is climate climate change, climate action, and we, uh, we just always want to emphasize that there are 16 other SDGs as a developing country we need to be concerned about, and number one is elimination of poverty, so we need to develop, uh, and, and oil and gas gives us that opportunity to develop. So we've identified a number of ESG priority areas. At this point, we don't have an economic priority area. We're currently in investment modes, we're being capitalized. But if we look at climate change adaptation and mitigation, as an example, we have a national program that we're spearheading, in which we are looking to reforest large parts of our national forest reserve that have been deforested due to uh, essentially due to agriculture and due to the need for uh, firewood, so biomass, 80%, 85% of Ugandans use firewood and charcoal uh, to, to, for cooking. And we really want to uh, reduce that demand. So one of the things that this project does is it produces a lot of LPG, a lot of gas, and then that gas will enable uh, uh, the average citizen to switch from uh, from biomass cooking to, to LPG cooking, and that will reduce pressure on, on, on our forests. So this project is called, uh, well, it's, right now the name is still being formalized, but it's essentially a Climate Action Alliance, together with a number of public se sector entities, together with uh, the leading uh, religious institutions in Uganda, Christian, Muslim uh, institutions, as well as um, uh, the carb some carbon market players is looking at reinstating in the, in the order of uh, 40 million trees as a start. And that 40 million trees is equivalent to about 1 million metric tons per annum of CO2. So essentially we're working towards making sure that our, our refinery is, is net zero with respect to scope 1 and scope 2 emissions. Um, so under uh, national content, as I've heard quite a lot discussed uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, we have seven pillars as part of our national content strategy. Um, we have, of course, the recruitment of Ugandan talent within our organization. Right now, we are 100% Ugandan. Uh, we work on national skills development. Uh, we work with schools, we work with universities, we work with the youth, we work, uh, you know, essentially looking at 50% of our population is below the age of 15. Uh, working on supplier capacity development. Uh, we work on, uh, on things like community content. So there's quite a number of activities that we do in all these areas, and we actually have some national content specialists um, in-house in to, to handle that. And so that really concludes the presentation, and I'll hand over it back to uh,